It is now time for question period. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, approximately 350,000 people over the age of 65 are currently receiving home care services in Ontario, which of course keeps them out of hospital. Health care providers, stakeholders, and most importantly, patients and their families, however, have told you that our home care system is broken. As it stands, home care services in Ontario are inadequate and inconsistent at best, and with an aging population and your fiscal mismanagement, nobody believes that the system will be equipped to handle future needs. Service quality and accessibility continues to deteriorate. Yeah. Premier, how much longer do seniors and their families have to wait for you to make the necessary changes to our home care system? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to comment on specifics, but I want to just say to the, uh, the member opposite, as I have said many times in this House, we are in a transition period. There's no doubt about that, that the, the way, way health care has been delivered in the past in the face of an aging demographic and different demands from people in terms of the kind of care they want and where they want it, there have to be changes made, Mr. Speaker. And one of the reasons that we put money in last year's budget Mr. Speaker, to increase the wages of personal support workers. Member from Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. Exactly the reason that the member opposite is talking about. We need a more stable sector. We need that part of the health care workforce to have more reliable income, Mr. Speaker, and Answer. to have uh, enough hours and enough stability in their job to be able to do the job, Mr. Speaker. I will note that the uh, member opposite never supported Thank any you. of those initiatives, Mr. Speaker. Well, Premier, the fact of the matter is our population is aging rapidly, and you your lead expert, Gail Donner, the former Dean of Nursing at the University of Toronto, said in her recent report, Bringing, home, bringing Care Home, and I quote, everyone is frustrated with a system that fails to meet the needs of clients and families. No one thinks the status quo is an option. Premier, this frustration is being felt by the 75-year-old that cannot get a personal support worker following a hip replacement. This re Frustration is felt by a daughter trying to get physiotherapy for her father, who recently suffered a stroke. And this frustration is being felt by the thousands of people who cannot get home care services that they need because of your inaction and the web of bureaucracy that your government has created. Premier, why do you continue to fail these families? Oh, Mr. Speaker, let me, again, let me just say, you know, one of the reasons that we put uh, money into the budget last year to increase personal support worker salaries, one of the reasons that we put $270 million more Speaker, from into the, uh, the budget for home care is because we know that we're in a transition and we need to make those changes. Yeah. So we will continue to make changes. I would note, Mr. Speaker, that the member opposite, who is in the middle of a leadership race, has said that she will cut a billion dollars out of the budget, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. That means Public services would have to be cut. That means health care costs would have to go down, Mr. Speaker. So I just think that the member opposite needs to needs to recognize she can't have it both ways. I would appreciate the quiet when a question is put, and the quiet when an answer is put. Am I, am I still? Super wrap up. I just, I just wanted to say you can't have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. You can't, on the one hand, say there need, needs to be more change and more investment, and on the other hand, say you're going to make a tax cut that will take a billion dollars out of the system. Right. The uh, member from Simcoe North will come to order. The member from Bruce Gray and Sound will come to order. Final supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I would appreciate that the Premier would stop trying to put words in my mouth that I never said. However, the Premier's own expert panel has highlighted that the two biggest issues with our home care system are excessive bureaucracy and a lack of accountability for system outcomes. Premier, this is nothing new. You've heard this for years and years from experts, from stakeholders, and most importantly, from patients and their families. Yet, you continue to ignore the obvious. Premier, the PC caucus has so far given you two ideas that you could put into a responsible budget. Our third ask Deputy is House Leader. simple. Will you follow the recommendations of the Donner Report, which you have endorsed? Will you make the functional changes to our system that we need to improve patient care? And will you tie funding to the community care access centres so that we can have improved outcomes and patient results? Will you do that? Mr. Long-Term Care. Please. 
Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Speaker and Mr. Speaker, we are doing all of those things. We are increasing our investments to home and community care, $270 million this year, uh, approximately the same amount next year, in addition, and the third year as well. But that's precisely why we had Gail Donner and a team of experts come together and they presented their report to me at the end of January. We have endorsed their recommendations. I have endorsed their recommendations on behalf of the government and indicated that it will guide our decisions moving forward. And I'm working hard with the ministry right now as we speak to actually put the changes in place which will further strengthen the home and community care that we provide to all Ontarians, including our seniors. But we've done many other things in the past several years. We've increased our investments in physio Therapy, where 200,000 yes, more seniors are getting physiotherapy or exercise services. We're increasing investments through a whole variety of Thank areas you. to actually make sure that seniors are. Thank you. New question. The leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Two weeks ago, Minister, I raised the issue of debt at the Ontario Electricity Financing Corporation. The OEFC has $27 billion in outstanding debt, largely paid for by Hydro One revenue, revenue that will be lost if you sell Hydro One. But, Minister, there's a larger problem here than just a loss of revenue. The entire value of Hydro One is already mortgaged to the OEFC. All $16 billion of Hydro One's value has already been claimed by the OEFC to pay down its debt. That's why the law requires that all sale proceeds from any share of Hydro One must go to pay down the electricity debt. So, Minister, how can you sell any part of Hydro One given that it is already fully Question. Okay. Minister Finance. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, the reason that Ontarians are still paying for stranded debt is because of the mess that the PC government put us in. And we have been open and transparent in getting. Minister. And Mr. Speaker, we've been very open and transparent about getting it reduced. And as a result, we have been reducing the stranded debt. I'm prepared to get my exercise. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Please finish. And Mr. Speaker, as a result of the work that Ontarians have been doing in getting it reduced, and as we have said and as we have outlined every year in our fall economic statement and in our budget, we've detailed how that's being done. And we have committed by the end of this year to remove the residual strata debt fees paid by residential by the end of this Answer. year. And so we'll continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, to the Minister of Energy or whatever minister wants to start telling the truth over there. The member will withdraw. <clears throat> withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Please. Again, to the uh, Minister of Energy. Minister, when you sell your house and it's mortgaged to the bank, you can't pocket the sale price Order. that you use to pay off the mortgage. If you did that, you'd be charged with fraud. Any profit from a sale of Hydro One has already been Minister of Children and Youth Services. That profit is owed to the Ontario Electricity Financial Corporation, Hydro One's banker. Minister, your government keeps talking about unlocking the value of government assets. Will you finally admit that all of the value Minister, tourism in Hydro sport. One, the biggest asset you plan on putting on the auction block, is completely mortgaged already to the OEFC? It's already spoken for, Minister. Member from Eglinton, Lawrence. Minister. The leftover of Ontario Hydro is OEFC. And what did the PCs leave OEFC? Debt. Yeah. And that's all that's been left over. 
As a result, we've been taking steps to remove that debt from the ratepayer. And in fact, the approach has been working. Last year, it was about $1.5 billion in further reduction of stranded debt. This is the tenth consecutive year that stranded debt has been reduced cumulatively by. Carry on, please. And, that, and over the last number of years, it's gone down by $10.8 billion. But, Mr. Speaker, the reason stranded debt even gone up and the residual portion of stranded debt went up is because they themselves artificially froze the rates because they went up by 30 percent, which caused the residual stranded debt to go up even higher. We're making, yes, taking corrective ac action to make sure that it gets removed from the system. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Ooh. You need, a, you need a real good briefing on the history of hydro in this province, because you don't know what you're talking about. There was $38 billion. The reason I broke up hydro is it had $38 billion in debt, Minister, and we couldn't continue to go that way. We got that debt down to a residual stranded debt. Member for Maglington Lawrence, come I don't order, know how in the world you guys, over 12 years, brought it back up to $27 billion, but I'm bloody well going to find out one of these days. We've asked the auditor to look into that, and we're going to find out. I suspect a lot of it's your high-priced windmills and your Green Energy Act, which is driving jobs out of the province and prices up. So, Minister, will you finally tell, be honest with the people of Ontario, what are you going to do with the $27 billion in debt? Are you going to leave it for the ratepayers and taxpayers of the future to pay for? That will mean skyrocketing hydro rates again. <laughs> Start the clock. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the fact that I am glad that the member opposite has admitted that he left to substantial debt at the OFC as a result of the mess up that they put forward. A member from Sarnia Lambton will come to order. And I'm going to fast track the names that I take, including anyone injecting while I'm speaking. Please finish. Speaker, during those days when the economy was actually prospering, not only did they try and mess up the high street deal, they messed up the, the sale of 407 and still left a deficit of $5.6 billion in our coffers, which we had to correct since going forward. Mr. Speaker. Answer. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario government. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Thanks very much, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. In 2003, when the Premier first won her seat, her leader, Dalton McGuinty, took a progressive stand, calling the sale of Hydro One, quote, a disaster for consumers. More than a decade la later, the Liberals have made a sharp turn to the right speaker. Now they're the ones planning to privatize Hydro One. So my question is, who is the right-wing ideologue in the Liberal cabinet that is pushing to privatize Hydro One? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I would just remind the uh, leader of the third party, first of all, of the reason that we are uh, to under uh, we undertook a review of the assets, Mr. Speaker, and that that the the sole reason that we wanted to do that, Mr. Speaker, is that we knew that investing in new assets, investing in new infrastructure, transit, roads, bridges around the province, Mr. Speaker, that that is necessary in order for our economy to thrive. And, Mr. Speaker, I would say, secondly, that the leader of the third party took a look at what we said we were going to do and then ran on it, Mr. Speaker, because part of her fiscal assumptions, part of her investment assumptions, Mr. Speaker, in her platform were exactly the assumptions that were in our budget, Mr. Speaker, and were in our platform. So yes, I would sir. say to the leader of the third party, we are now executing that review, Mr. Speaker, because we know that making the investments that we commit to is necessary, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the decision to privatize Hydro One marks a hard right turn. The Premier has made a right turn that is so hard that she's now got her back 
to Ontarians. The Premier must know deep down that privatizing Hydro One is a short-sighted, bad Stop the clock, please. Goes both ways. Please finish. However, after more than 10 years of taking the progressive position that Hydro One should remain in public hands, the Liberals have decided it's time for them to privatize even more of our hydro system Minister of Economic than Mike Development come and order. Ernie Eves managed to do. Will the Premier tell Ontarians what's behind her sharp Question. Right, right turn towards privatization? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker. Premier. I completely understand why the leader of the third party would want to get into an ideological debate right now, because she it's necessary for her to reposition herself as a progressive, Mr. Speaker, because she lost that brand completely when she decided not to support a budget that was going to invest in the people and the infrastructure of this province, Mr. Speaker. So, so Mr. Speaker, having not governed ideologically, Mr. Speaker. I have never, I have never suggested that Essex, ideology or polling is the way that, uh, that I would govern, Mr. Speaker. I made practical decisions, Mr. Speaker, and we put those into our budget, we put those into our platform. And, Mr. Speaker, at this point, what I will say to the leader of the third party is we're sticking to those decisions yes, that sir. we made. We're sticking to those practical solutions to the, to the problems that are confronting us as an economy Thank and you. as a province right now, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Well, Final supplementary. This premier, who has insisted over and over and over again that she is leading the most prog progressive government, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, second time. Humanity, Speaker, yep. and yet she is turning harder right than Ernie Eves and Mike Harris. Right. Even Ernie Eves backed off the plan right. to sell off Hydro One, Speaker. Can the premier square that circle for us today? Can she explain how going further right than Ernie Eves and Mike Harris is possibly in any? way progressive and what she claimed to have been a progressive direction that the Liberals were supposed to have taken. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would just say to the leader of the third party that she is the member of this legislature, along with her caucus, who didn't support a minimum wage hike, who didn't support our pension plan, Mr. Speaker, who, who in fact, as, as recently as the last couple of days, can't actually decide whether she supports fighting climate change or not, Mr. Speaker. So, in fact, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the leader of the third party, if you want to look at practical solutions, that's great. But if you want to have a conversation about ideology, you're going to be on the losing end of that every time, Mr. Speaker. You see that, please? You see that, please? New question, the leader of the third party. My next question is for the Premier. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Ontarians are getting deja vu all over again. Their government has made a right-wing decision to sell Hydro One. They were never consulted, Speaker, about that decision. They were never asked whether they want higher hydro bills and the loss of a very important strategic asset that belongs to them. And now, Sheely and some legal, legal experts, the Premier's plan might not even be legal, Speaker. It is 2002 all over again. How did the Premier, Premier lose her way, Speaker? Again, Mr. Speaker, I say to the leader of the third party, I understand why she's trying to find her way because, uh, Mr. Speaker, the initiatives that we've taken on this side of the House to invest in infrastructure, to put in place a retirement pension plan, to move on climate change, Mr. Speaker, I know that waffling on those and not having a position on those has been very painful for her. But what I will say to her, Mr. Speaker, is that we ran on the necessity to review the assets of this province, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we can invest in new assets. We are taking a practical approach to that, Mr. Speaker. Ed Clark is bringing out the details shortly, Mr. Speaker. Yep. He will be talking about how we can approach these things in a way that will preserve the interests of the people of Ontario, that will preserve ownership, Mr. Speaker, and will preserve the interests in terms of regulatory and Answer. price control. The leader of the third party hasn't seen those details. We'll wait, Mr. Speaker, until Thank the you. details are out, and then she can comment. Can you see it, please? 
Supplementary. I think it's important to talk to Ontarians for a minute. The Liberal government, the Premier, is planning to sell off your Hydro One. It's going to mean that your electricity bills are going to go up. It's very possible, according to legal experts, that in fact her plan is not even legal Order. here in the province of Ontario. And once we privatize Hydro One, let's not forget there are no do-overs, there are no mulligans. That uh, is going to be a situation that we can never take back. Hydro One, your Hydro One, will be gone forever. It's a bad deal for every single Ontarian. Can the Premier tell the people of Ontario, Speaker, how it is that she is going to be ramming this bad deal down the throat of Ontarians without even once asking them what they Question. think about this idea? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, first of all, the leader of the third party has absolutely no idea what we are going to do, Mr. Speaker. She has, she has no details, Mr. Speaker, because those announcements have not been made. Ed Clark and his group of, uh, of experts, Mr. Speaker, are going to be bringing forward a report, and we will, at that point, have that discussion, Mr. Speaker. But I will say to the, mem I will say to the member opposite. I'm hearing a familiar voice that I can't quite see, and I know that if I could find him, he would know I would tell him to come to order. To the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, that she has put forward no plan to make the investments that we know are necessary in this province, Mr. Speaker. She has come forward with no practical solutions to the, uh, to the infrastructure deficit that we're facing, Mr. Speaker. Yes, she sir. has no plan for how we can build the roads and the bridges and the infrastructure, the transit that we need in this province if our economy is going to thrive. There is no plan coming from her side. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier was first elected on a plan to keep Hydro One in public hands. She knows that selling Hydro One will mean a disaster for consumers. She knows this, Speaker, fundamentally. She knows that what she's doing might not even be legal, Speaker. She knows that it's a short-term decision that will have long-term aftershocks for people and businesses across Ontario, not only soon, but for generations Minister to come. Government First of all, come order. the Premier has never asked Ontarians, not once, what they think about this plan, and now she's treating it like it's a done deal. Will the Premier shut down the right-wing ideologues that are driving this and do the right thing for Ontarians? Thank you. you see that, please? Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, I do not believe, nor does anyone who has looked at the economy of Ontario, nor do people who are looking to invest in Ontario, believe that unless we invest in infrastructure in this province, we will be able to compete in the 21st century. We're just not going to be able to, Mr. Speaker. And so, in our platform, when we ran, we said, we are going to look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario. We are going to... Maybe I should stay standing all the time. We are going to ask people with experience to look at those assets and to work with us to optimize the value of those assets, Mr. Speaker, so that we can invest in the infrastructure and the assets that are needed for the 21st century. What we're not going to do is we're not going to sell off the Answer. way the 407 was sold off, Mr. Speaker, yeah, so that there would be no future return. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. And your time is up. Your question. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, uh, Speaker, I have a question to the Premier. Premier, just 10 months ago, you told Ontarians very clearly that a carbon tax wasn't in your plan. Yeah, I remember. Then, just this week, you introduced a carbon pricing scheme that you yourself admitted was a tax on everything. Yep. Now, Ontario's independent petroleum marketers are sounding the alarm bell that the impact of your carbon tax will actually drive prices at the pump up much higher than you've claimed. You clearly know the impact of your scheme, but you've told Ontarians they must Remember wait for six months. From Mississauga Streetsville, come to order. Details. Premier, why do you not think that Ontarians don't deserve to have the truth about your job-killing carbon tax today? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
Um, I wish that, uh, I wish that um, more members of this legislature had had the opportunity to be with the uh, Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change and, and I in Quebec uh, over the last uh, couple of days, Mr. Speaker, because had they been there, they would have heard leaders from across this country, from every province, Mr. Speaker, with the exception of Alberta and PEI, Member from Prince election, Edward Hastings, they would have heard order. leaders from all party stripes saying that it is critical that we move now, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. It is important that we move to do our part to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, Mr. Speaker. And it's critical not for political reasons. It's not for partisan reasons, Mr. Speaker. It's for the future of the planet. It's for the future of our children and our grandchildren, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we have sustainable economy Answer. and sustainable environment going forward. That's what this is about, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Back to the Premier. Premier, you know it's not about the environment. And it's really about the money. It's about the money. No one, all about the money. No one believes you anymore, Premier. You say you say carbon tax is not in your plan, then we find out it is. You've rolled out the bait and switch that the tax will be reinvested into transit when other reports indicate that you've not determined whether it will actually flow into general revenues. Premier, you can't tell us where the money's going because you're making it up as you go. You can't tell us the cost because you have no idea of the cost. Right, remember to the motorists, health to industry, to consumers. I remember the health premium. You just know that after driving us into debt, this is your ticket to raise revenue. I need to hear it as much as I need to hear the answer. Please finish. I'll read that line just so you do get to hear it. You just know that after driving us into debt, this is your ticket to raise revenue on the backs of hardworking Ontarians. Yep. Yep. Premier, will you do the right thing today and provide Ontarians with the details on how much your job killing carbon tax is going to cost those hardworking Ontarians? Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Actually, we're now into a six-month design process, so we're looking for for input from the members opposite, and we have lots of experience to go on, Mr. Speaker. And this will be a very democratic and fair process. But, Mr. Speaker, I have to tell you, I'm perplexed that a member of the official opposition would be asking such a question, Mr. Speaker, because this isn't the first. Case. First of all, I've been hearing things I'm not appreciating, so the member from Lanark will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga, the question was asked. Listen to the answer. So, not only is this I'm going to tolerate responses, like and the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will come to order. <laughs> And this is, uh, this is precisely the reason why I get emails asking me why we can't get control here. It's you, not me. Any member has an opportunity to withdraw at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, hopefully I can get my answer because I think the member deserves an answer on this. And we're a little perplexed because this isn't the first cap and trade system in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This is the third. We have cap and trade on Knox. We have cap and trade on Socks. And Mr. Speaker, what party introduced those? It was brought over there. So there's the cap and trade party, Mr. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Quebec, Alberta. It's amazing, Mr. Speaker. And they don't read because it. That's it. Do a question. A member from Toronto Danforth. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Today, legal experts came to Queen's Park and told Ontarians that the Liberal plan to privatize Hydro One probably isn't legal. Public sector workers who believe in public ownership have made it clear they're going to fight the Liberals in court on this. Can the Premier tell Ontarians whether she's planning to wage a long, expensive legal battle with public money, or is she going to change the laws of the land just so she can privatize Hydro One, leaving Ontarians with higher bills. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the people of Ontario, the government <coughs> is Hydro One's sole shareholder. And as with a shareholder, the province has the right to broaden the ownership of Hydro One. And following the lower court decision in 2002, the government passed legislation that amended the Electricity Act that clarified its position. 
and the Electricity Act of 1998 is amended to repeal Section 48.1 and replace it with Section 49.1, which authorizes the minister to acquire, hold, dispose of, and otherwise deal with securities of debt obligations of or any interest in Hydro One on behalf of its subsidiary or on, on a subsidiary. So finding ways to generate revenue to help Ontario invest in its long-term infrastructure needs is, is badly needed for highways, transit, projects like Ring of Fire and other things that we must replace. Answer. This, uh, Mr. Speaker, is an opportunity to realize on the true potential of Hydro One to reinvest those assets Thank where you. necessary. And we're doing it legally and thank you supplementary speaker again to the premier i want to read something from the legal opinion released today experts say quote there are grounds to challenge a decision by the minister of energy to sell securities debt or any provincial interest in hydro one as being an unreasonable or come to order. irrational exercise of the minister's discretion under the act and according to these experts, selling 60% of Ontario Hydro's distribution assets would actually reduce the province's income by $133 million per year. The Premier's plan is irrational. It's bad for families and businesses. It's bad for economic growth. It's bad for energy conservation and a green economy. And it will actually mean less money for investments in hospitals, schools, and roads. Will the Premier pull the plug? on this unreasonable and irrational plan. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Energy. Mr. 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 Speaker, uh, this particular issue has been raised over the course of the last day or so, and in every single case, the so-called legal opinion has said may or might be illegal, Mr. Speaker. And the uh, the critic uh, on the other side, Mr. Speaker, uh, talks about uh, uh, the, uh, the the plan that we have. You finally, Mr. Got Mr. A Speaker, question. there's no plan that's been put out there. We have a concept we've been working on, Mr. Speaker. There's no particular plan. There's no details upon which any lawyer can make an opinion based on not having seen what we're going to be doing. Mr. Mr. Yes. Speaker, we're broadening the ownership in Hydro One. Mr. Speaker, we're limiting other shareholders to less than 10 percent if we go forward with any deal, Mr. Speaker. The ratepayer will be protected, the taxpayers of Ontario will be protected, Mr. Speaker, and it will be yes, done sir. legally, properly, on behalf of the people of Ontario. Thank you. No question. The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Toyota has been a great partner and contributor to Ontario's economy since first opening here almost 30 years ago. And since that time, they have invested almost $7 billion, creating thousands of jobs. To remind the House, Cambridge is, the on is home to the only Lexus plant outside of Japan, a testament to the quality of Ontario's auto manufacturing sector. Toyota has been a staple of my community in Cambridge for almost 30 years. Not only Cambridge's largest employer, Toyota has given much back to my community. Just as recently as 2012, Toyota announced that it was investing over $100 million to increase Lexus RX capacity at its Cambridge assembly. Question. Through you, Speaker, would the minister please update uh, the House on the announcement that Toyota just made uh, today? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. And uh, This is indeed good news uh, today for Cambridge, good news for Ontario's auto sector. Once again, Mr. Speaker, we have a, an auto uh, sector partner that's going to be making some very significant uh, investments here in Ontario. We've been assured uh, with today's announcements that, in fact, the, uh, the worker footprint in Cambridge and Woodstock and in Ontario will remain uh, totally intact. Uh, we've also uh, received uh, assurances that, indeed, uh, further investments are going to be made in those plants to ramp them up, uh, Mr. Speaker, and this is the good news, uh, so that they will then, by 2019, be able to, uh, to manufacture some higher-end vehicles in those plants. Fantastic. And that, Mr. Speaker, is better value for manufacturing here in Ontario. Answer. What it speaks to is the fact that we have some of the best quality workers, some of the best quality plants here in Ontario, and that's why Ontario is being used. Thank you. Supplementary. Update. Toyota's Ontario plants have won 12 
J.D. Power Quality Awards, wow. including the 2014 Platinum Award for the highest quality amongst assembly plants worldwide. Toyota's Cambridge facility has received more awards than any other assembly plant in the world. I am extremely proud of the work that's being done in my community, and I know that the employees at Toyota take a lot of pride in their work. As I understand it, Toyota is not the only Ontario auto manufacturer that has made recent announcements. Through you, Speaker, would the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure please inform the House on new developments in Ontario's auto sector? Thank you, Minister. And Mr. Speaker, while we recognize that the environment for auto investments remains very competitive, since November, we've seen $4 billion of investment here in the province of Ontario, right across the province. Wow. From Alliston, where we saw $857 million investment from Honda, uh, to Linamar in, in Guelph, where we saw a half a billion dollar investment by Linamar, uh, to Markham, where they're building the sexiest car in, in North America, the Ford GT, uh, which is an incredibly innovative uh, car they're building now in Markham, uh, to a $2 billion investment uh, in Windsor by Chrysler, and, uh, which is great news, uh, and indeed uh, this announcement by Toyota that they're going to continue to invest in Ontario and build even higher-end vehicles here in this province. Great news and for the auto sector. Mr. Speaker, we still have lots of work to do. We're going to work tirelessly to keep building this sector in this province. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Millions of Ontarians with workplace pension plans are facing uncertainty. You have created this uncertainty. Yep. By ignoring the concerns of the deputations at committee, people are left with no answers. Ontarians don't know who will be forced into your plan and who will be exempt. People need to know. Businesses need to know. It is time that you treat Ontarians with the respect they deserve and stop running from the details. So, Premier, the question, who is in and who is out? Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member opposite for this question. It is an extremely important question that we're asking ourselves about the future of this province and how people are going to be able to afford their retirement. Mr. Speaker, I have visited 10 communities across this province, talking to people in roundtables, in stakeholder forums, and what people are telling us, Mr. Speaker, is that they are concerned about their retirement. Two-thirds of, of workers in Ontario do not have a pension plan. When we look at the private sector, it's at 28 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to actually thank the efforts of the, the committee uh, for their work in looking at the framework legislation in F Bill 56, which sets out the government's commitment to implementing the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan by January 2017. Mr. Speaker, this is about the future Answer. of this province. This is about people affording their retirement in a 21st century economy, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians need a mutually acceptable definition of comparable, a definition to provide certainty. They need to know how your legislation will affect their future. By your refusal to consider amendments to your proposal only uh, contributes to the uncertainty. Without concise, transparent details, Ontarians fear the consequences of this legislation. Ontarians want to know what pension plans you consider good enough to be exempt from the Ontario Registered Pension Member from Plan. Trinity Spadina, when come to order. are Ontarians going to have the confidence that their defined contribution workplace pension plan will be safe? Question. Mr. Speaker, in fact, the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan is about providing more certainty for the retirement futures of the people of this province. Mr. Speaker, this is about ensuring that when people retire, that they have adequate
adequate income for life and that they can continue to spend and consume in their communities here, here. that rely so much on retirement and pension income. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows full well that we actually accepted an amendment from your party for Bill 56. So we are working on the details of this plan. The ministry officials are reviewing all of the submissions that have come in through our Bert. consultation process, which has gone right across this province, asking the people of Ontario. You're absolutely right. It is about assuring people that when they retire, that they can retire with yes, security and with dignity. And that's what the ORPP is all about. Yes. Order. New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Very much uh, to the Premier. Yesterday, the, the Liberal Finance Minister was asked about whether he'd released the full Clark report, but he wouldn't give a simple answer, let alone a sophisticated answer, to this important question. Deputy House Will Leader. the Premier commit to making all of Ed Clark's recommendations public? I think yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah. So the Premier's hard turn to the right and her plan to privatize hydro makes it clear. It makes it clear that she doesn't care about good. Please put your supplementary. Very much. Uh, again to the Premier. So the Premier's hard turn to the right and her plan to privatize hydro makes it clear that she doesn't care about good or fair policy or even what's in the best interest of the people of this province. She only cares about putting politics first and the short-term interests of the Liberal Party. And it's clear that the Liberals don't want to take any responsibility for the privatization of Hydro One or public utilities. We're hearing that the Clark report <coughs> might come out on Thursday. We hear that we might hear everything. But you can't blame the people of this province for having doubts. In the last year's budget, they snuck in cuts to hospitals and to educa ed education. So will the Premier promise in this House that all of Ed Clark's recommendations will be released Question. for full public scrutiny in a single report tomorrow? Well, Mr. Yes. Mr. Speaker, my, my uh, my answer is yes again that uh, all of the recommendations will uh, be made public but mr speaker i just i just want to go back to the uh, the genesis of this whole conversation what this is about is making sure that we have the capacity to invest in the infrastructure that is needed in this province mr speaker that's the starting point for this discussion i know and i think the member opposite knows she lives in a part of this province mr speaker that needs more transit yeah, mr speaker yeah, she knows in her region, there needs to be more connectivity to Toronto. She knows that the businesses and the innovators in the Kitchener-Waterloo region, they want to be able to move back and forth from Toronto, Mr. Speaker. She knows, she knows that in order for that to happen, there has to be more investment in public transit, Mr. Speaker. So that's what this is about. That's the solution that we're looking for, and the report's recommendations will be made public, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy. Mr. Speaker, poverty is an issue of concern for many in the province, including the residents in my riding of Halton. In fact, it's estimated that one in ten people are affected by poverty in my riding. Groups like Poverty Free Halton, Community Development Halton, and the Halton Poverty Roundtable are working hard to address local poverty issues through a series of initiatives including building social awareness and calling for increased engagement from the local business community. But more can always be done. That's why I'm proud that our government launched Ontario's second poverty reduction strategy in September. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is our government doing to ensure that we build on local solutions to reach people battling poverty? The minister responsible for poverty reduction strategy. Thank you to the fantastic member from Halton for this question. Reducing poverty has been an important priority for this government since our election in 2003. We are making a real difference in the lives of people, but we know that we are just beginning this journey. There is much more work ahead of us. 
We also know that fighting poverty is not just a top-down initiative, Speaker. We've, I've always said we need all hands on deck. We need all levels of government. We need community Member organizations. From East, Stony Creek. We need uh, the business community, the nonprofit sector. All of us need to work together to really make a difference. I also know that poverty looks different in different parts of this, of this great province, and that's why we've announced the launch of the uh, a local poverty reduction fund. $50 million over six years yes, to support grassroots uh, partners as they help lift people out of poverty. It will fund innovative programs that target Thank groups you. disproportionately affected by poverty. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that question, uh, that answer. My constituents in Halton will be happy to know that the government is partnering with different communities to combat poverty. Local organizations have taken innovative steps to educate residents and leverage community assets to maximize poverty reduction strategies. The Halton Sport Leadership Program, for example, is a program that empowers young people facing economic hardships and teaches the skills required to enter the job market. By working with organizations like these, we can help people become healthier and ready for employment. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, how can organizations apply for the Local Poverty Reduction Fund? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And last week, uh, in the, with the MPP from Northumberland, Quinty West, uh, we launched the first part of a two-stage application process for the Local Poverty Reduction Fund. Right now, we're inviting organizations to, to submit an expression of interest for a sustainable poverty reduction project they're interested in evaluating. In May, there will be a formal call for proposals to determine the first round of community organizations to access the fund. A wide variety of groups are eligible to apply, not-for-profit organizations, registered charities, Aboriginal communities, fostering collaborative partnerships across Ontario, and building the body of evidence to guide future decisions speaking are invaluable in our collective poverty reduction efforts and, and are a key component of the poverty reduction strategy. And I especially look forward to, uh, to seeing what comes out of the Thank great you. community of Hamilton, who are real leaders in this. Thank you. Your question the mayor from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance this morning. Minister, back on February 26, the House passed my bill to raise a glass to Ontario Act at second reading with support from the government and the official opposition members. However, when the bill could have been given hearings at committee so that some of Ontario's great small businesses like our craft breweries and our cideries and our wineries could be given a chance to comment on the reforms they want to see in the beverage alcohol sector, the government blocked it. Oh. Minister, once the Standing Committee is done dealing with Bill 40, will you commit to giving hearings to the Raise a Glass to Ontario Act so that we can have a public discussion here in the Legislature where it belongs and not just in Ed Clark's office? Good question. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, House Leader, Mr. Speaker. Leader. Well, thank you, Speaker. I find the question really odd because I think the member opposite knows, and I'm sure his in the craft beer and wine and spirits sector, they de de depend on these reforms both to show how they can sell their product and remove red tape uh, from the procedure, especially in areas like transportation and warehousing. So what I'm asking is, will you commit to giving my bill committee hearings so that these businesses can actually speak their piece to MPPs in Question. a committee? Or will you continue to keep this process secret and wait for the next edict to come down Thank you. in Ed Clark's report? Good question. Well, clearly, I think, I think, Speaker, anybody who's not being kept in the loop is, is the member opposite from his own House leader, so maybe they want to they wanna be able to have a change. But, Speaker, I think, in all seriousness, we know that there needs to be changes uh, changes that need to be made in the, in, the, in the beer sector in the province of Ontario. The Speaker and the Minister of Finance have spoken to it uh, at many times. We also know that Mr. Clark is, uh, is looking into that issue, and he'll be releasing his report shortly. So I encourage uh, all members uh, to await for the results of the recommendation that will come out of Mr. Clark's report. Of course, the, the Minister of Finance will be speaking to it uh, as well next Thursday in his, in his budget uh, that will allow for us to have sufficient conversation uh, on this very important topic and look forward to uh, Mr. Clark's report. Thank you, yes, Speaker. Sir, thank you. New question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. 
The province of Ontario has vital interests on Toronto's waterfront. Our stake in Waterfront Toronto is worth more than a billion dollars, and we're investing millions in a new urban park at Ontario Place. The province also has an interest in protecting the ecological health of Lake Ontario. Post Ports Toronto recently revealed plans for Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport that would allow large jets and a massive expansion of the airport infrastructure and operations. Torontonians are extremely concerned about the impact of these proposed plans on the city's waterfront revitalization. Ontario Place and Lake Ontario. These plans are proceeding based on a pseudo quotes unquote environmental assessment that has no legal recognition under the federal nor the provincial environmental assessment acts. Speaker, will the government protect provincial interests on Toronto's waterfront and insist on a Thank proper you. legal environmental assessment? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and uh, Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to get the question from the member opposite and appreciate her sincere concern. The uh, City of Toronto is the authority responsible for this and for zoning and for the waterfront. Having been a mayor, I have always been very happy when provincial governments did not try to second-guess uh, my, my role or that of my city council, and we're not about to do that, Mr. Speaker. We'll allow the proper environmental assessment process to go through. Uh, we'll, we'll look to the city council for proper stewardship, because we trust Mayor Tory and his council have this well in hand. And as a party of the Waterfront Toronto Agreement, we will continue to support the water front plan that we signed with the other two orders of government with this government is very important. We're also happy and pleased with the over $500 million that we've invested, the investments we've made in George Brown, Mr. Answer. Speaker, uh, in the waterfront parks and that we're making right now, uh, my colleagues are making, and we will continue to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of the Environment. In fact, progressive councillors are looking to you for action, Mr. Minister. Uh, and also, of course, he knows that airports fall under federal jurisdiction, but that does not justify silence from the provincial government, not when Ontario's interests are threatened. And that's what we're talking about, Mr. Speaker, Ontario's interests. In fact, under Section 32 of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, the provincial government may substitute a provincial EA process to ensure that provincial interests are properly addressed. Prominent Torontonians, Paul Bedford, David Crombie, Jack Diamond, Ann Golden, Ken Greenberg, as well as community groups like No Jets TO, Code Blue TO, have pointed out that Ports Toronto's phony review will not Question. give Torontonians the facts they need. With so many vital provincial interests at stake, will the government end its silence, stand up for Thank Toronto's you. waterfront and Toronto, and get that environmental assessment done? Fine. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this government is doing more than stand up for Toronto's waterfront. It is doing unprecedented investments, and anyone and we're laying over the Pan Am Games, which my colleague at. There is more exciting stuff happening on the Toronto waterfront since we were elected in the entire history of this province, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We're very proud of that. We also. I also know my city councillors, Councillor McConnell and Councillor Wong Tam. I have an excellent relationship with them. Neither of them have phoned me and said, Minister, we want the provincial government to substitute an alternative process to the federal and municipal process. None of them. We have no, no request from the mayor, and we have no request from council. So maybe the third party thinks that provincial government should insert their politics and their political agenda into municipal politics or the waterfront, but we don't, Mr. Speaker. We also have a very clear environmental assessment process that asks the Minister of Environment yes, to sir. stay out of politicizing it and let the public servants and a fair-minded evidence-based review. Are my ministry is already doing that, Mr. Speaker, and they will complete that work. Thank you. Any question? The member from Northumberland could be rushed. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Min ministry, many people in my community and communities across this province may not be aware of the risks carbon monoxide poses to their families and loved ones. Carbon monoxide is an odorless, colorless gas that is often referred to as a silent killer. More than 50 people in Canada die from carbon monoxide poisoning each year. But, Mr. Speaker, the real tragedy is that each and every one of these deaths is preventable. Today, new regulations surround the use of carbon monoxide alarms 
in multi-unit dwelling com come into the force. With the new rules in place, we hope to better protect Ontarians from the silent killer. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain Question. this new regulation and share with us how it could save lives in Ontario. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, for raising such an important issue. Speaker, as, as the member mentioned, carbon monoxide gas is a silent killer that continues to claim too many lives um, in this province. Speaker, I want to thank you and the member from Oxford for your leadership on this very uh, important issue. Speaker, as of today, car uh, carbon monoxide alarms must be installed in the service rooms and near all sleeping areas in all residential buildings, from your average family home to small apartment buildings with up to six living units. The rules, Speaker, also include annual testing, battery replacement, and other requirements to ensure that carbon monoxide alarms in these residences are in good working order. Speaker, large buildings such as condos, hotels, and high-rise apartments will have until this October to come into compliance with the new rules. Uh, stalling a carbon monoxide alarm is perhaps one of the simplest and most effective ways to alert you and your family That's to the true. presence of this lethal gas, which would help them escape in the event of a leak. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank, the, uh, thank you, Minister, for your action on this important issue. I'm certain that, many, ma I'm certain that making CO alarms mandatory for homeowners and landlords will help save lives within my community and across Ontario. CO alarms are a very important tool for alerting our families in an emergency, but often a working CO or smoke alarm is not enough on its own to protect our loved ones from danger. In the event of an emergency, when CO or smoke alarms sound, we must all know what to do and where to go. After all, we would only want to leave the safety of our loved ones to chance. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please share some information on how we should properly prepare for carbon monoxide or fire emergency Question. in our homes? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. It is truly important, Speaker, that we install carbon monoxide alarms in our homes and test the batteries regularly. But the member is absolutely right that we need to do more in, in order to make sure that our homes and our families are safe. Speaker, in order to protect our loved ones during an emergency, we must go farther than installing and testing carbon monoxide and smoke alarm. Every one of us should take a few minutes with their households to make an emergency escape plan. Draw a floor plan, include all possible emergency exits, uh, show two ways out of every room if possible, and decide who will require assistance. And as the acting district chief for Toronto Fire Services said recently, Speaker, setting up a, set up a safe meeting spot outside the front of your home where you can then call the fire department. The best way to ensure the safety of yourself and your family in an Answer. emergency is to have a practice plan of action in place because emergency safety is everybody's responsibility. Speaker, I encourage everybody to go to emergencymanagementontario.ca for more information and a Thank draft you. of those emergency plans. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On February 26, the Greater Sudbury Police Service Board asked the Ontario Civilian Police Commission for direction yeah, do, from several requests for the removal of Jerry Lawhey Jr. The request not only came from the opposition, but also from members of the public. Despite the request from the Sudbury Board, the OCPC cancelled its March meeting. Oh. The OCPC was scheduled to meet yesterday. They cancelled that meeting. What? You're kidding. Let me remind, remind everyone that under Section 25, Subsection 1 of the Police Services Act, your minister can request the OCPC to investigate, inquire into, and report on the conduct of a member of the board. Premier, will you agree with me it's time for the OCPC to stop cancelling meetings and start doing their work? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. I think the member opposite knows uh, very well that there is a defined process by which uh, uh, a police service board can uh, refer a matter uh, to the Ontario Civilian Police Commission, the OCPC. Uh, there is a code of conduct also outlined by way of re regulation through the police services board that allows uh, uh, outlines the uh, obligations. Uh, of a member of the Police Services Board. Member uh, Speaker, as we understand the matter uh, by the Sudbury Police uh, Services Board, 
is, has been referred to the Ontario Civil and Police Commission. But, Speaker, what I want to remind the member opposite and all members that the OCPC is not an arm of the government. It's independent of government. It's like a court. Uh, and we, the government, do not dictate Answer. to OCPC to take any particular action. It will be, it will be wrong, Speaker. Uh, it will be breaking the law and will let Thank the you. OCPC to do their independent work. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks, yeah. Speaker. Back to, back to the Premier. Listen, the Sudbury bribery scandal is a very serious issue. The Chief Electoral Officer tabled a historic report that highlighted apparent contraventions of the Election Act. Despite a request from the Greater Sudbury Police Services Board, the OCPC has cancelled two meetings in a row. When we asked them why the meetings were cancelled, they referred us to their lawyer. Something's not right, Speaker. This doesn't pass the smell test. Premier, has anyone from your office or your minister's office spoken to or met with the OPC in any way in regard to the Sudbury bribery scandal and the request from the Sudbury Police Services Board? Minister? Uh, uh, Speaker, I, I, I want to be absolutely clear that OCPC is an independent Any body. Pass. In fact, it Only falls under the Ministry of the Attorney General so that we can maintain the arm's length nature of OCPC. Only to make allegations the kind that this, the member opposite is making uh, is, is, is not fitting, Speaker, because we respect, and we've been saying this from the very first day, Speaker, we respect the independent work of the investigative bodies uh, in this matter, uh, and we should, we should let that process uh, continue, and we will not interfere in that process at any time whatsoever. So I want to be absolutely clear, Speaker, that OCPC is independent from the government. We should let OCPC do its, its, its work. We do not direct OCPC. We do not tell them when to schedule the meeting and when not to schedule the meeting. And we want to respect that independent uh, educative process. Thank, Thank you, you, Speaker. Question member from Timmins, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Mi Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Hearst, as you know, is connected to Thunder Bay via a bus system. This private bus system has cancelled its services, and I asked you yesterday, as I'm doing today, is the minister prepared to intervene in order to find a solution that we can put into place so we can put into place bus services between Hearst and Thunder Bay so that people don't have to drive for 17 hours in order to go to a medical appointment in Thunder Bay? Much, Mr. Speaker, and I very much appreciate the question. We did have an opportunity to discuss it yesterday. One of the things I do want to say is I was, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that our government has made a commitment to keep four of the five lines of the ONTC in public hands. Uh, a little over a year ago, we made that uh, that decision and that announcement. And earlier this week, uh, uh, we, ha we, put our, we have put a, a new board in place. Uh, uh, the chair is Tom Lochran, the former Mayor Timmins, who is, a, who is the chair of the ONTC. And I know that these are the kinds of matters that they will want to be a part of the, uh, discussing as well. So I appreciate uh, the challenge that's being faced with that uh, uh, that uh, operation, and it's an operational decision, may I say. So it's one that I will be pursuing and following up with the uh, uh, the ONTC CAO uh, and interim president, as well as the board. Answer. And I would uh, encourage you to do the same. Thanks very much. Thank you. Point of order from the member from uh, Toronto Danforth. I'd like to recognize Dr. Andy Siriopoulos, a dentist from my riding, who's here with us today. Welcome, Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to correct my record. I, I, I think I misspoke earlier. The cap and trade systems introduced by the Conservative government were on nitrix oxide and sulfur oxide. I think I said sulfuric oxide. Thank you. The minister, member from. Member from Leeds Grenville on a point of order. Thanks, Speaker. I just want to recognize uh, a local dentist from my riding, uh, Kim Hansen. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Um, just a reminder for all members, uh, please wait until I recognize the questioner and the person giving the answer before you stand up and start answering. It's not helpful to the microphones because they are instructed to wait until I recognize the person on either side. Um, it is, uh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.